So, so the talk I'm going to give, you'll, you'll probably notice, has a lot to do with geography and city planning. Um, but really, it, uh, it kind of was put together because when I got flooded by Hurricane Sandy when I lived downtown, I realized I didn't know as much about Jersey City as I probably should. And so I did a lot of research, and this is kind of the result of that. So a geographer's perspective on a city is kind of what I'm trying to give. And of course, it's going to be Jersey City. And a geographer, um, when they look at a landscape, they kind of note the physical uh, artifacts that you see. And the general theory is pretty simple, that every physical artifact you see is the result of some force that created it. So if we see a picture like this, I don't know if I can, oh, that's not going to work. OK. Well, if we see a picture like this, we can see the, uh, the straight line of the New York City shoreline. And you can contrast it with the kind of undulating coastline of Jersey City. This is 1854 in Jersey City. And those are kind of clues that we can use to ascertain how much involvement by human forces have been on the landscape. This is just an example of how a geographer might start to look at things. <clears throat> and, um, and what I'm going to do over the course of this presentation is kind of build Jersey City from the ground up, like literally the ground up, um, from the geology that underlays the city, the various layers of that, and then go into the kind of human geography and the human history of development here. Um, the presentation's a little longer than I think I have time for tonight, so I'll probably end in around the 1860s, 1870s, which is when this house got its current form, so I thought it would be a kind of appropriate time. Um, so the first step that we have, to, or the first stage, I should say, is geologic time. Uh, geologic time, I'm not going to try to like download all of geology into your brains, but this is just kind of our clock that we're going to refer to. Um, if you think of that as like the course of 24 hours or 12 hours, then the morning is the beginning of Earth 4.5 billion years ago, and every every like three hours is about 1.5 billion years. The history that we have here is these four uh, these four eons. Uh, well, three of them are eras and one eon, um, but that stretches us back to about 1.5 billion years ago. Um, I'm going to go a little bit through maps today. Through the course of events, I'll just try to give you a general gist of how Jersey City got its shape. So here we are in Jersey City. Jersey City is about the size of midtown to downtown. It's 17 miles square. And uh, it sits at the mouth of three different rivers, which is actually a pretty unique aspect. It's at the end of a 40 mile long uh, stretch of cliffs and at the end of three different ways to, the, to access the ocean, which is why so many people live here even today. Um, and if you ask me, it's one of the most interesting places a city could be located, perhaps missing some dynamic geologic features, but that's because we plowed them under, as we'll talk about. Here's, the, uh, here's kind of a close-up. You can see the Palisades Cliffs actually do end in Jersey City. We just kind of butchered them so badly that you can't recognize them much as cliffs anymore. Um, and, uh, and that's the reason why you had so many railroads that kind of cut through. Uh, here's kind of a picture of what the place once looked like. Um, and then that place that we're looking at is at this edge of a continent. And that's kind of the story we're going to have to tell. Uh, it looks like we're just kind of the, a generic part of the continent. But the major geologic regions in this area, the, these ancient highlands, the Rift Basin, the Taconic Arc, um, all actually intersect right here at Jersey City. Um, and you can see, so there's, so these various colored regions are um, bits of bedrock that are closest to the surface. And the four, these four different bits of bedrock are what created the land here. It's a, it's a continuous story. And it just so happens that those four bits of bedrock were formed in those four different times that are in blue or in green on this mm -hmm. clock. So step one, the ancient highlands. They're during the Proterozoic Proter period. Step two was in the Paleozoic period, which means like old life. Proterozoic is early life. Everything was multi-cell, or was single cells, basically. And then uh, the Mesozoic period, which is like middle life. You start to get dinosaurs and the like at that time. And then Cenozoic is basically when we've been in, in existence. I mean, it's much older than that as well, but. The time I'll talk about is when we've been in existence. So the ancient highlands, this is the mountains in 
in the highlands of Jersey City, um, and they are about 1.5 billion years old. So here, just to give you a sense of how old that is, since it's kind of impossible to understand, um, I'm going to sh show how much the continents have moved in just the last 600 million years. So the star is the location of, the, of Jersey City, where we are today. And, um, and if you note, here we have the ice uh, in Greenland and in Antarctica, there's deserts and there's greenery all over because, of course, there are plants all over. The, the fossil record kind of shows you what kind of plants and what kind of um, climates were in all of these places. So that's how these maps are kind of pieced together with some geolocating data from certain um, bits of iron in various rocks. So 15,000 years ago, glaciers cover all of North America. The glaciers are about a mile thick above Jersey City. They end at Staten Island. They, and the sea level is 360 feet lower, and the coastline is hundreds of miles to sea. I'm going to go quickly, quicker than that in all of these. But humans haven't evolved 20 million years ago, and you see that the place looks basically the same. 35, 55, 65 million years ago, Jersey City is almost in the exact same location. So the rocks, that, the land that we're, talk, we're walking around is actually not that dissimilar to when dinosaurs were walking around here. And here we go further back in time. You see the continents start no longer quite look like each other. Pangaea forms, the first dinosaurs are about 220 million years ago. <coughs> Keep going back, Pangaea is still around. Start, it's, it's no longer around here. I'm going backwards, it's a little confusing, I know. But the first land animals are 370 million years ago. The first land plants are only 400 million years ago, which sounds like a lot, but Jersey City's rocks are 1.5 billion years old. So we have to keep going back. And so we get back to about 540 million years ago, the first explosion of complex life. 600 million years ago, this is as far back as we go, the supercontinent Rodinia exists. It had been in existence for about 500 million years. And for all that time, Jersey City was kind of sitting as it is there. <laughs> and at three various periods during that time, all of the Earth was covered in ice. So it's a little hard to re recreate maps of any. This is as far back on the Earth's clock as we got. But Jersey City starts right around here, when um, we think part of Brazil collided with, uh, with, Jer with, with the coastline of, of um, North America. And that caused a mountain range to start um, that stretched from Canada to southern Mexico. We don't have any maps, of course, at this time, but there's a lot of evidence around here. Like I said, the exposed rocks in the highlands of Jersey City are this old. They've been just sitting there eroding since 1.5 billion years. And in those exposed rocks are certain uh, deposits of graphite, which is of course, famous in Jersey City because of Dixon uh, Ticonderoga. So the way you make graphite gives us evidence to what happened back then. And uh, the way you make graphite is take carbon, heat it to a temperature of 1300 degrees, crush it with 75,000 pounds of pressure, and, uh, and then you'll have the little tip of your pencil. Um, that's how they make graphite now when they manufacture it. The graphite in Jersey came from ancient algae because there were no land plants or animals back then. And, uh, and two mountain ranges, well, a mountain range was formed and then buried the, these ancient algae deposits. Um, we have records of the, of the kind of um, collisions that have happened in the fault lines that you see in this map. It's very hard to do this without a pointer. But in the, pi the pink area on this map is, uh, is the crystalline rock, this ancient rock that's still exposed. The yellow area is sediments that have filled in a valley. And, uh, and then all of the dots are the various earthquakes that have happened since the 1600s. The largest one is about a five. Um, that happened in 1880s. So um, we may one day feel such an earthquake ourselves. Um, the largest fault is this fault that stretches right along the very edge of the Newark Valley. It's called the Ramapo Fault. Um, and it's why the Newark Valley uh, is a valley because one time a long time ago it dropped. We'll talk about that in a second. But the next step is the, uh, the Hudson waterfront and parts of Manhattan, parts of Connecticut. 
that happened about 520 million years ago. And this is a lot more recent, so we have a little bit more evidence to deal with. And they even have little maps that they think represent what happened back then. So 560 million years ago, you have part of Jersey City on North America and part of it in a mountain range, um, which we now call the Taconic uh, Mountain Range. And so, so North America was drifting. The island, the, the chain of islands called the Taconics was chasing it. And about 470 million years ago begins to collide with North America, bringing the two together ultimately to merge around 450 million years ago. That's what, that's what creates the Hudson waterfront right here. This is the furthest south uh, exposed rock that's left over from this collision 450 million years ago. Um, and when we, from the rocks that are still here, we can kind of see what that, what that collision looked like. So here we have the Taconic Island arc and North America. The ground, there's of course ocean bed between those two places, and that ocean bed is actually what we have around here. That ocean bed was kind of scooped up through multiple colli collisions, and a mountain range builds on top of it. So when you take mud, muck, and little bits of algae and crush it under 25 miles of stone, you get Manhattan schist, which underlies not only Manhattan, but you also underlie the very edge of the Hudson waterfront where the skyscrapers are. Um, and those little bits of black are identical to the graphite that you use in a pencil because it's just crushed carbon. The other type of rock that you get, which, is, which was deeper than that mud and muck, is actually the ocean floor itself. So this is called serpentinite. It underlays the Stevens Institute Hill. Um, that whole hill is built out of this stuff. And also Tote Hill in Staten Island, which is a much larger. Um, it's very infertile, which is why Tote Hill never became farmland. Um, so the Taconic Islands, when they hit, we're now at 375 million years ago. Um, when they hit, they were actually followed by uh, two other island chains that collided and just continued to make more mountains. And the biggest mountain range of all formed when Africa collided with North America. So that creates Pangaea, we're about 308 million years ago, about 80 million years before the dinosaurs. And right now you have giant swamps stretching from down here. And you can kind of vaguely see if you're close, the state lines. So here's like Tennessee, here's Pennsylvania. So here we know in Pennsylvania, we're giant swamps filling with peat. And then that peat over time gets filled with more sediment. And that gets crushed down into coal, which of course is vital to the, uh, to the settlement of Jersey City over time. This is the powerhouse, which powered the path station. And then, of course, the PSE and G plant, which is now being decommissioned, um, uses that same coal. Um, this, the location of that coal, the local coal being in Pennsylvania, also gives us a lot of names that we still have in the Jersey City area, such as the Lackawanna, Delaware, the Lehigh Valley Railroad, the Pennsylvania, the Erie. All of those were first built to transport coal and then second to build, powered by coal to move passengers. So our third step geologically is the Palisades and Newark Basin. We've now moved up to about 250 million years ago. That's when that Ramapo Fault I was talking about. Um, so North America and Africa have collided, and they actually rebounded rather quickly. Unlike Rodinia, which lasted for 500 million years, this only lasts for about 80 million years and starts to, starts to back away from each other. So at that time, you have all of these little sand areas are rifts, giant valleys that are opening up, splitting up, splitting Europe, North America, and Africa apart from each other. And so the Newark Valley is actually the Newark Rift Basin. And it too was when the continents are splitting away from each other, um, that crystalline rock is in no longer being pushed on top of each other. And so the Ramapo <coughs> Fault, which was presumably created when one rock hit another and went up, once once the continent split out, it went back down. And so underneath here, underneath that yellow spot, is more bedrock, but it, it's just fallen kind of closer to the center of the Earth. And so in that time, it fills with sediment. And, and as I was saying, this happened not only in Newark, but also here you can see down there, there's Gettysburg. Here's the Connecticut River Valley. 
And this is the rift that won the day, which we now call the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but once upon a time, they looked like this. And as we noted before, it's a kind of sandy color. For much of the time, we can tell by the rocks that it was a dry climate. And when you have dry climates, the rocks oxidize. And, uh, and, uh, and you have this kind of reddish tint that forms. It also, you also have less organic matter in the stone. So this is a sandstone that was, that's on the embankment. Uh, there's also a similar sandstone outside of this building, which presumably comes from Newark or Connecticut River Valley, which have various similar sandstones that we also call brownstones in Manhattan, which is where that name comes from. When it's even drier, there's, here you see like inclusions of little rocks that's eroding mountains that kind of get swept down by streams. When it's even drier, it's mostly very fine sand. And so when you touch a stone that has no rock inclusions, that means that only fine sand was put there. Here, this, this may be actually an, uh, a root fossil, so, but it's a little hard to tell from here. There are definitely fossils in this rock. This one is in, uh, this is in a natural history museum which is a much more exciting animal than a root. And it's 36 foot long phytosaur, which is not actually a dinosaur. This was found in Fort Lee. Um, it predates the dinosaurs. And to me is perhaps even scarier than a Tyrannosaurus rex. <laughs> At other times, we can tell from the rocks that are in the Newark Valley that the, the valley got wet um, and here, in this map, we actually kind of can see a little representation of a lake. And when that happens, you have totally different rocks form. This is a more grayish rock. And if you look very closely, you'll see tiny little shells, because when there's sea life, they, a lot of them have shells. And they create kind of a limestone breccia, they call it. This is, this is that. You can also see a fan of some sort. I can't profess to know what animal that is, but this is the 10th Street Embankment. If you want to just go look along it, you can see various fossils. Um, over near the Home Depot in North Bergen, there's actually a very famous fossil field just to the right-hand side of the Home Depot. Um, this was found there. It's the, the, one of the oldest lizards ever found. It's 228 million years old. And even by then, it already could fly like a flying squirrel. Not fly, glide, I should say. Um, it's called the Icarosaurus for obvious reasons. Um, so a feature of all of that rifting when you have these giant valleys is that sometimes magma leaks out. So about 200 million years ago, catastrophic amounts of magma came out, causing one of the Earth's great extinction events. This is called the CAMP, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. And all of these, uh, all of these orange areas released magma at some time in their history. The magma around here was released around 200 million years ago, 201. And that we can see in the Palisades. And you can see also in the Watchung Hills. Um, the Palisades were an intrusion of magma that started from, from the Earth's mantle into the rocks of the Newark Basin. And then they kind of found a layer and kind of squeezed out. And actually, we can tell from the way the magma, the, the way the Palisades look now, that they didn't actually make it to the surface. They squeezed out, and then there was still just a little bit of rock on top and that the glacier is removed. So now we can see them. Here's the actual geologic map of this area. The bright pink is where, the, is where that magma kind of intruded to. So the entire, the entire elevation of Jersey City is all magma. It's not just the cliff face that you see. And of course, it's been used to build much of our buildings. This is the Sixth Street Embankment with a sandstone cap over a diabase, but diabase is what you call a magma when it's become a rock um, base. So our fourth step then is the Hudson River and Long Island. Of course, the Hudson River is a channel, but that channel was kind of etched out about 50, well, the etching of it perhaps finished 15,000 years ago. Um, and it was caused by glaciers. And um, those glaciers, as we pointed out before, extended all the way down to Jersey City, not they went just, just past Jersey City. And here in this map, we kind of can see it a little bit better. Um, this map is actually very precise because, it, again, it was only 15,000 years ago. Once you create this entire little range of mountains that the glaciers did, 
they don't really move anywhere. You'll notice there's a gap there. We'll talk about that in a second. But these, these arrows are actually the flow of the ice, which we can tell both, we can tell from two reasons. One, the, the glaciers were like bulldozers, so they pushed rocks. So when we find anthracite coal in places that humans haven't put it, we know the glacier moved it from, from Scranton or so on <coughs> down to New York City. And then the other reason is that various, this is a, an outcrop of bedrock behind Dickinson, and various of those have striations that were caused by gravel being dragged underneath, the, underneath these giant glaciers. And again, they were a mile high just above our head right here. This is kind of a, a pretty picture of the view of New York Harbor, and you can see where, uh, where Brooklyn, Long Island, meets with, up with Staten Island. There's a giant gap. Everything around us, like the dominant like, look and feel of it today, all comes from this glaciation event, um, except for that giant gap. And that gap is caused because, um, because as, the, as the glaciers started melting, Lake Erie swelled to about three times its current size. And that, that swelling was enabled by a dam made out of ice. That dam of ice eventually melts. And then there's a catastrophic flood about 13,000 years ago that, that comes down the Hudson River and hits the New York Harbor, swirls around, presumably rather dramatically, overtops the Staten Island, Long Island Island at the time, which was continuous, and then channels out its own channel to the sea. This is the previous, this is the previous water channel for the Hudson River, and it's why there's a channel of water behind Staten Island. So this was the shortcut that it took about 10,000 years ago. Um, I revi I'm revisiting this slide that just reminds us kind of how much time have gone, has gone by. Just to show, this is the last glacial maximum, LGM, and the temperature was about eight or nine degrees cooler. We got up to, to about 10,000 years ago, and the temperature kind of evens out, and humans have had civilization during that period. We have decided to make things interesting, and we are going to go up by about five to 10 degrees Fahrenheit within the next 50 to 100 years. And the amount of sea level rise from here to here was 360 feet. So when people talk about the six feet of sea level rise that's expected by 2100, you have to remember that you, what we're actually locking in is hundreds of feet of sea level rise that will not stop under any circumstances. So this is what will happen within about 100 years, and nothing on this map is over 160 feet tall. So if we lose, if we lose Greenland and lose much of Antarctica, this is all underwater, and it's all history just like we've talked about. With that happy bit of news we'll switch to <laughs> mankind, the Anthropocene, <laughs> to see what is eventually underwater. So this is Hudson County's kind of natural shape. I refer back to this line, to this map, just because I know the maps get real confusing. And um, here where, the, where these green patches are, this is old tidal lands. I'm not sure if you can see, but there's a creek that goes right here. Um, that creek was actually quite deep. I think I'll talk about it later, but that's Mill Creek, of course, for those of you who know. And Mill Creek was so big that in the 1770s, there's an ad for a 35-foot sailboat or 30-foot sailboat that's for sale, and it's parked at Newark Avenue. So you could sail from Newark Avenue on out into the, into the harbor. But we're going to go from, we're going to go through the various populations of people who are kind of settled, who kind of settled the early part of Jersey City. So the first were the original people, the Lenny Lenape, which is Lenny Lenape for the original people. So it's quite simple. And uh, we eventually called them the Delaware because someone named Delaware decided to do so. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing for this talk is kind of the physical remnants of that time. So this is a, uh, a map in the dark lines, only the dark lines, try to ignore the, the 21st century lines of roads. But the dark lines are the roads that we're still using today that were in use at the time that the Dutch arrived in Jersey City. So Jersey City at the time was, Lena was part of Lenape Hoking, which is just the word for the place that the Lenape people live. And, uh, and it was a crossroads because on one side you had the 
Passaic, and the Hackensack Rivers, which are basically highways into Jersey. And on the other, you have the humongous Hudson River, and you have access to the ocean. Um, so all these roads were used just to kind of cross. Um, I'll get back to a minute to how we know that people were crossing there. But I just want to read one quote that I have from an old book about Jersey City um, to talk about how lush this place was. Because it's hard to believe, given what a reputation it has now, and to think about how terrible the Meadowlands are. So here they say, the forests abound, abounded in all kinds of useful trees, many of them bearing delicious fruit. Vines grew everywhere, yielding in abundance. Plants of nearly every, every variety grew in great profusion, useful for food and medicine. Throughout the forests roamed buffaloes, panthers, deer, elk, foxes, wildcats, wolves, raccoons, beavers, otters, musks, hares, squirrels, of course, and groundhogs. At times, the bay appeared to be alive with waterfowl. The birds were so numerous that the shores and islands appeared as if dressed in white drapery. Geese were so numerous that 16 could be killed with a single shot. Ducks, widgeons, I don't know what that is, teal, brant, bluebills, whistlers, coots, eel shovelers, and pelicans, and many other unnamed fowl roamed the rivers. The river and bay were rich in many kinds of fish, among which were whales. Among the shellfish were lobsters, some of them supposedly five to six feet in length. And oysters, trillions of oysters, lived in the base of the area. It's estimated that uh, as many as a quarter of the world's population of oysters lived in the bays around the New York Harbor. Flocks of now extinct passenger pigeons were so large that they would block out the sun for days at a time during their seasonal migrations. So that was the Jersey City that the Lenape knew. Um, the, this is the area that the, the, the Lenape called home. They, uh, they were a distinct people, but they, actually, they also were part of a larger language family, one of the largest in North America, and they stretched all the way to uh, Western Canada. And some of the words that they used um, to describe this area, we actually still use, not all of these, but, um, but this one I find quite interesting. I don't think we use it anywhere, but it means the place of good crossing. And, um, and so we can surmise that they like to cross it's right there. Pamrapo. Yeah, Pamrapo. Yeah, Pamrapo and Ahasimus, we say Harsimus now. Hoboken, Hoking. Hoking is like place. Uh, were they exaggerating? Were they exaggerating? Yes. With the... Description of the Well, you know, I'm sure they... I'm sure they took poetic license, but the passenger pigeons, for sure, they weren't exaggerating. They would fly over for days at a time. Um, there's like later records of that. So, um, yeah, and, and um, harbors are known as one of the most um, vibrant of ecosystems, um, supporting large populations. And uh, so I, I wouldn't think they are. Is that one up there, Sikakis? Yeah, Sikakis. It meant. Um, it meant the place of the snakes, which is also where a snake yes. hill comes snake from. Hill. Snake hill. Right? Yeah. Isn't that crazy? It Apparently, it'll. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we walk and yeah. walk and right, yeah. Um, and uh, these islands, we don't still use them, but this one was, it meant Gull Island, and this one meant Lesser Island. And this is pre presumably where the word communipaw came from. Um, so the next group of people I'm labeling the Swanikins, because to call them Dutch would be perhaps a misnomer. So the Swanikin was the Lenape word for the Dutch who came over, but it was just, it meant salt people, as in people who came from the salt water. Uh, I also like to imagine that it was a pun because they didn't really have great relations between the Swanikins <laughs> and the Native Americans. Um, so I think it's important to understand what was happening at this time when the Dutch came over. So the first Europeans to visit, or visit the shores of Jersey City and the area were started in the 1500s. The first person came from France. And basically, at this time, you have a number of nation states, some of which were ruled by one person. This, all of these colored nation states were ruled by Charles V, who was the most powerful emperor in about a thousand years. Um, and, uh, and his reign in particular triggered a series of wars that needed to be paid for. So you had a lot more exploration happening from Europe. 
1524, the first visitor uh, to, the, the, to the New York Harbor was Verrazano. Um, he encountered Native Americans, but he was in such a hurry that he thought the Hudson River was a lake. The second representative, was, the second was a representative of Spain, um, and that he was representing Charles V. Charles V um, was a very staunch Catholic, and he uh, rather angered his original, um, the, his original people, which are the in the Netherlands, and so they ultimately end up rebelling and have designs to cut into the Spanish monopoly on the spice trade. So they create the first multinational corporation in 1609, the Dutch East India Company, and they send Henry Hudson to the Hudson River to try to find a, a Northwest Passage. He, uh, he doesn't manage to do that, but they do find a lot of beavers and groundhogs and other furry animals that they decide to start buying and selling in Europe. It was a very minor part of the Dutch West India business model. The primary uh, part of their business model was slaves from Africa making sugar in the Caribbean and Brazil. So it's important to remember where these people came from and what they were after. This is a picture of the, one of the first homesteads in, uh, in Jersey City, the Van Voorst homestead. We know this is not a picture of the first one because the original home burned down not once, but three times. <coughs> this is the third home. The first time it burned down was during the first party thrown at the house. Somebody, <laughs> someone shot a gun to say goodbye to his guests, and it caught the thatch roof on fire and it burned down. <laughs> I like to think that that was the beginning of Jersey City's history. Um, the second time it burned down was for less fun reasons, uh, because it was during the first Dutch-Indian War. The second was also during a Dutch and Indian War. The, uh, the first Dutch-Indian War was caused by the massacre at Pavonia, when uh, the first Dutch governor, a ma man named Kieft, was, uh, was basically kind of a certain, a, a bit like a certain uh, leader who's in power right now, and wanted to, wanted to tell the Native Americans who was boss. And so when they came to ask for protection because they were having a conflict with another tribe, he instead had them slaughtered. So 200 people died. And of course, the backlash was so fierce that all, um, basically every single settlement outside of New, York, New Amsterdam was burned down by the Native Americans. What year was that? Roughly? That was 1643. 1664. Yeah, it was next. No, 1664 is when, no, that's, oh. 1664 is when Bergen, where we're standing, was actually carved out. So there were two Dutch and Indian Wars. I think one was six, yeah, 1643 and 1655. And then, um, and then Stuyvesant comes into play. Stuyvesant's a much more reasonable character, and actually maybe even a little bit enlightened. And so the relations with the Native Americans become much better. And the people who have fled Jersey City are allowed to move back, as long as they build a stockade around their town. So the way it was set up was, if you recall this map of the roads, this circle here, was a major crossroads in Jersey City, and so they put stockades around the crossroads, and they called it Bergen Square. So that's where we're standing right now. Those, those stockades would have been maybe just a couple, I mean, it's just like two or three houses that way. Um, the, uh, the, the Bergen Township is also the oldest town in Jersey City, or, uh, and of course, it ultimately becomes part of Jersey City. Um, the apple tree house is presumably, let's see, that's the gate to the mill, so it's right there. But this building, well, that room over there, was, I think, was built in maybe 1710. And then the, the, this part was an, a later addition. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> Aaron told me that a little earlier. Um, if you notice on this map, I'm going to be showing another one. So here, here's the name that it, that this place went by at the time, it was Bergen, and then, I don't know how to pronounce that. And, uh, and the border was right along the water. That actually becomes very important in Jersey City's history, because New York ends up owning the water. Um, 
but here was kind of the most revolutionary part of Bergen. Um, here's Bergen Village. It's founded in 1664. I don't know why that says 1630. Well, no, it is 16. I, oh, is it? I was public information officer at the library. I retired last year. But actually, the, we have Dutch documents in the New Jersey room that really illustrate that Bergen, Peter Stuyvesant signed as the first person to sign the contract, and that was in 1660. So we were able to prove by references of different historical things to um, then NJN News that literally Jersey City is the birthplace of New Jersey because of Bergen Square in 1660. So then this map is right. Don't listen to me. <laughs> um, but the part I want you to focus on is the woods, the common lands. Bergen was formed under Dutch law, and at the time, what they said was that the freeholders who held land in Bergen Village, who held land in Communipaw, a couple people held land in Harthmas and Palasuk, that they owned all of Bergen Township, which was quite extensive to the north, um, larger than about the same size as Hudson County is today. All of that was held in common. Um, and from that time, we actually have three holdovers. It, of course, this house, the Apple Tree House, the Sit Manor House, which is not no longer in Bergen Square, but it dates from 1664, and the Newkirk House, which dates from about 1690. I find this wall right here really interesting because it has all those rocks I mentioned, except for Sir Pentonite. <laughs> um, but uh, but those houses here, here's a map. This is actually from 1780s a map the British drew, but Bergen didn't change a whole lot in the first century. And so this is the location on that map of where those three houses were. Again, that's, that's Apple Tree House, Sip Manor House, and the Newkirk House, which was outside the stockades. Here are the names that the, the Dutch used for this area. You can see they kind of just butchered some of the Native American names. Um, and Eastland Slagenberg means the island of the snakes. So there were a lot of snakes in Secaucus. <laughs> um, Bedloe's Island I find fascinating because the guy who owned it and for whom it was named in 1699, 1669, when he passed away, he, uh, he made it a place of privilege from the warrant of arrest. So if you were uh, if you were being chased by the cops, supposedly you could go there and get a sanctuary. I kind of think it was maybe a joke because it's it was also called the Lesser Island. They probably drowned. Um, the company farm is also very interesting. It's also called the Duke's Farm. <coughs> and basically, when Michael Poe, um, who was a burgomaster of of New Amsterdam, of Amsterdam, actually Amsterdam, he uh, he he basically was allowed to get a, a noble title by promising he would bring 50 people to Jersey City and to Staten Island. And in exchange, he, got, he was given all of this land. So that became, he never brought the 50 people. And so that was such a, a scandal that the Dutch, East, the Dutch West India Company took back control of that territory. And like I said, that was, that was Harsimus Island and Staten Island, and so that's, the beginning of the reason why those places are still controlled, or, or became controlled by New York. The company farm on Harsmith Island was actually owned by New York, and you had to pay New York your rent to live there until the 1800s, until they kind of worked out the border between New York and, um, and New Jersey. Okay, so the next group of people I'm calling the Knickerbockers, because this is these are English subjects by this point, but they're Dutch people, because this side of the river actually remained very Dutch for a very long time. And so they basically were farmers who were supplying, who were supplying uh, the people across the river. But they were preserving their culture to such an extent that at one point George Washington thought about taking the petticoats that people stored as like their prized possession to help his, um, to help his war effort. Uh, the uh, not a lot of roads changed or anything at this point, but um, but this this very dark border that I've drawn is the border that was established when the Duke of York sold off to his debtor Carteret the land in New Jersey. So he was savvy enough to realize that the money in New York is in the trade, and the trade happens on the water. So he said 
that, that Carteret's claim stopped at the water. And that actually stunted growth, the growth of New Jersey for another, I mean, this is in 1714. So I think they settled that the border is actually in the middle of the river, only in like the, in 1804. Um, the other big thing that happened at this time is that the freeholders gave up the kind of ghost on the commons because they had been so um, appropriated for private use. And so all of the land was divvied up. There's in, in intensive documents that show kind of the different parcels. But if, if you actually compare these lines, which are the lines of various parcels of land, they, many of them are the exact roads that we have today. If you know, Jersey City has these huge long blocks with, with minimal uh, north-south streets. That's because of the shape of the parcels that were given out in 1763. Here's a little flavor of what Communipaw looked like. Um, it's actually a rather open and natural landscape. This is a zoomed in version. This is kind of the outflow of Mill Creek. This is Communipaw Bluff and that's Communipaw itself. Um, the massacre that I mentioned, there, was, there used to be a house on this. Um, here you can see that house. And this person actually was, was um, known for having very positive relationships with uh, the Native Americans. So, um, so he had had them on his house. And interestingly, he had had them on his land. And interestingly, when they exacted revenge, they spared him and his house because of his hospitality. Um, here's some of the names that kind of begin to develop over this time. Again, you don't really have many people here, but, um, but Bergen Town becomes a place. The Heights is called Bergen Woods. Mace Land means corn land. It's actually a very ancient name for it. Pamirpog or Pamirpug, I don't know quite how you'd say that. Um, but you can kind of see how the names have kind of gradually change. And Secaucus is still Secaucus. <laughs> Uh, so then the revolutionaries, this is of course around 1776. Here's Palace Hook. Um, and you can kind of see the fortifications that the Americans made. Um, I have to give an obligatory story about the Apple Tree House here because the name comes from this time. Um, the legend is that in 1779, the Marquis de Lafayette met Was George Washington in this very house and dined under an apple tree in the backyard while discussing strategy um, with the, against the British Army. Um, it, years later, in 1821, the apple tree the pair dined under fell down during a storm. Shortly thereafter, the pastor of the Dutch Reformed Church presented uh, the Marquis de Lafayette with a walking cane made of wood from that tree, which is now on display at the Louvre in Paris. It bears the inscription, this shaded the hero and his friend Washington in 1779, and it was presented by the Corporation of Bergen, which is the town that we are currently in, kind of. Here's a Pryor's Mill, and this is Mill Creek. This is, you can kind of see better, like um, Newark Ave would probably be over here, but um, here it says rebel work in ruins because the rebels didn't know how to build things. <laughs> Um, I want to just give a little flavor of um, kind of the resiliency of roads. This is, uh, this is the, those roads that I said had, were all in use from before the time that even the Dutch had been here. The one, that, the one exception is this mill, mill road that came from Bergen down to Palace Hook. Here's what mill road looks like now. This is the island. This is the path train um, kind of spot. The path train itself goes there. And it's kind of hard to tell much of anything. You can see Academy Street comes down. And this is what that road looked like back in the day. So Mill Road came from both the Maze Land and this is where Bergen is up here. And they kind of found a gully to come down where they could navigate the Palisades. Again, we have rebel work and ruins. <laughs> I don't know where this is, but there is some archaeological site to be found. And so I've highlighted in yellow Mill Road. And if you look closely on this map, it's impossible, I'm sure, for you to read. But what I've circled in red is Mill Road that still exists in Jersey City. And if you draw that line over it, those roads are actually all still there. It's just that the, uh, the road here cuts into the path train property and goes down to where there used to be a roundhouse. 
And so it's been appropriated for railroad use, and that's why we no longer use it. But the road itself actually still exists and is still used by the railroad. Um, here's a picture of Palace Hook a little bit later, just to give you a sense of how natural this was even in the Revolutionary War. Um, the British fortified it a lot more and, um, and held the, they took it over like really early in the Revolutionary War. I think we maybe shot a couple cannon at them and then retreated. Um, so they held it the entire war. Um, and then after the war, things kind of quieted it down. This is uh, Jersey City from Communipaw Cove. So you're kind of looking back. Jersey City at that time means Palace Hook. Um, and, uh, and Jersey City uh, was founded in 1804. So remember Bergen is where we are now. It was, diff it was a different town entirely from Jersey City, which was settled on the very tip of, of uh, Palace Hook. This is the original plans for it. This is um, uh, the Washington Square, is that the name for it? I'm actually blanking on its name right now. Um, so, so three, so as I mentioned, the Dutch kind of held very strongly this entire area for several generations. Um, this, in this time, Cornelius Van Voorst, the descendant of one of the first settlers in this place, um, sold out to three New Yorkers, and that was kind of the beginning of the transition of Jersey City into a much different place. So he sold Palace Hook, just Palace Hook, to three New Yorkers who consulted with Alexander Hamilton, the Alexander Hamilton, to create a new town called the City of Jersey. They asked for it to be called the City of Jersey, but the legislature overruled them and said it would be called Jersey City. <laughs> At the time, Palace Hook was known, quote, as a sand hill, as a sand hill both in fact and reputation. Um, and this is kind of a picture of what it looked like. This is a cornfield in Harsimus Island. There's a sh little stretch of land that would be covered by, uh, by the tide, and then Palisook is all the way out there. This, these are some settlements on Harsimus Island, which was then, again, the Duke's farm, or the company farm. This is a windmill that was on the coast of Harsimus Island called Edges Windmill. This is from 1831. Um, here's just kind of an atmospheric uh, picture of Jersey City from around the same time. You can see Edge's Windmill there. And this is one of the only pictures I've found of what was called the Point of Rocks, which was kind of a last dramatic outcrop of the Palisades Cliffs, which was where the island is now. Most of that was just kind of torn asunder and used to fill Mill Creek. This is today the end of the Heights, or what, that, that area? This? Yeah. Yeah, this is um, like, this would be just, so Newark Ave would be kind of just to the right of it, and there was a big outcrop of, of like exposed cliff um, where we now call the Palisade island. Avenue. Yeah. Yeah, that's Palisade Avenue. Yeah, the end of Palisade Ave, basically. Here's kind of a picture, this is a coastal survey. Um, it kind of shows you just how different by 1844, New York's history and Jersey City's history is. So here's New York, and you can see all of these piers and Jersey City, and the only piers they have are right there. And even then, they're actually fighting with New York um, until, the, until, I think, the teens for the ability to allow a ferry to run across the river, because New York claimed the entire river for many years. Um, but you can, you can see just how different the two places are. The, these black shaded areas means that it's completely built up. So this part of Jersey City was completely built up. But this part is actually, there's roads, but it's all just speculative land. Nobody's actually really built any houses there. And closer to Bergen, we see that there are working farms. So there's Bergen, there's a little build up, but then surrounding it is just all farms. What year was that? This one is from 1844. Um, it's one of the coastal surveys, that's why there's so much data on the, on the water. Um, here's a kind of picture of where Jersey City thought its development would go. They thought they would build it nice and flat. You notice that there are no railroads involved in their plan. This is in 1858. Um, and actually, the, there's a very faint Jersey City Waterworks sign there, and that's really one of the turn, turning points of Jersey City, is when we started to get water that wasn't contaminated from the Passaic River, and we went a little further afield. 
Here are some of the names that were used at the time. Um, we're starting to recognize these names a little bit better. Um, Crossroads is kind of my favorite name. That was the name that was given prior to calling it Hudson City. So uh, just, well, I guess I'll get to that story a little bit. Um, but interesting uh, to note here in the green, this oval was a racetrack. And this oval was uh, one of the first prototypes of a railroad in the country um, created by the people who founded Hoboken. So um, you have this water line or water channels um, separating Pavonia and Erasmus from Bergen. Yeah. So when were those eliminated? So, the, um, so this dark line is the first railroad to cut across. And that basically, that, when that, that was built in the 1830s, and that basically was the death knell for those tidal creeks. Because the tidal creeks, there's no elevation change. So they needed to be flushed out by the tide that came in and out every day. Once the railroad cut this off, then these become backwaters, and they just become, they become more and more stagnant over time. So this was Oyster Creek, and it just becomes a sewage creek. It's like the most disgusting thing ever. And, if, and um, as the 1800s progresses, that's exactly why this area and this back area here is where more of the immigrants live. And you, have, you don't have the big brick structures being built there because richer people didn't want to live near the is there uh, where a lot of land development occurred? Because I love with the sign on Montgomery, I think it green, says that's where Robert Fulton launched the Claremont, the first steamboat. And then, of course, you see we have a lot of land, so that's where the river, land I figured, fill. was. Yeah. So the rest of it's all landfill. But when did landfill really start? So it will, I, I'll, uh, that's a great segue yeah. to this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so when the industrialists came to town, that's when landfill really started. Oh. So here's that first railroad I was talking about. Um, this is 1858. Um, we're actually on Mill Road. This is how bucolic Mill Road is. The, rail, the train's coming here. And this is that hilltop, that point of rocks that I was mentioning. There's a beautiful house kind of overlooking all of, all of the area. That's where Dickinson is now, the high school. Actually, this is a little further down. This was mostly destroyed because this is where the railroad goes. So they needed to get rid of much of this in order to build that huge flat, flat area. Flat. Yeah, so Dickinson's just a little further back. Um, and that's contemporaneous to this picture I showed you earlier. Here's that same railroad. Here's the kind of depiction of the, of the Palisades Cliffs kind of coming to a point. Um, and at this time, Jersey City is really starting to take off. We're manufacturing steel, porcelain, glass, uh, crucibles, brass iron foundries, railroads, steam engines, pyrotechnic establishments, jewelry, pencils, starch, and oil candles. Um, all that in this tiny little place. Um, and here you can also see Hoboken. Uh, and New York is, of course, much, much larger by this point. Um, so this is a picture of Jersey City. I actually don't have the date on this. Um, and, uh, and this is a picture, you can't quite read this, but this says, in 1829, our population was 1,000. By 1870, the population was, uh, I think that's... 62. Yeah, 62,000 or so. And so, and this is just Jersey City, remember, that it, by 1870, we haven't merged with anyone else, or we, well, Jersey City hasn't. When I was looking at the population, see, 1840 is when Hudson County developed as Hudson County. It split from Bergen and Essex counties on February 22nd, 1840. So look at the difference. It's really not very, very many people, and yet they, they still felt the need to split into a separate county. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, and then I wanted to point out just the horseshoe, if any of you ever yes. heard that term. The horseshoe follows basically exactly the Mill Creek. And here's the other side of that. And so, again, this is why the immigrants went to that area, because when it was cut off. population from like 1850 to 1855. It's like almost more than almost tripled. Yeah. The, um, and that is, and the railroad is built in uh, the 1840s, so it's really just the, the kind of dawn of industrialization. Um, so here, this is a map of the survey of lands lying under the waters. 
of the Hudson River in New York. Um, it, was, it was to accompany a report to the commissioners of the, the legislature of the state of New Jersey. Um, I wanted to note that the dates in you know, the 1860s, but by that point, um, they didn't actually have permission to be taking over all that water. They just had such control of the legislature, this being the railroads, that they were very confident that they'd get permission. The other problem that they had was that Jersey City here, the access to the waterfront is what they needed, and Jersey City had that huge influx of immigration. And so those immigrants were hard to control politically. And so in 1868, um, and, the, and the years later, they, they begin to um, set up a merger of Jersey City with the surrounding towns. Um, this is kind of just a quote uh, showing how much power the, the railroads had. The Camden and Amboy was the name of the railroad line that ultimately extends from basically Philly to Jersey City. Um, it's founded by the same people who founded Hoboken, the Stevens family. Um, and, and eventually becomes the primary revenue source for the state legislature. So they have basically complete control over the state legislature. And in large part, it, it's what dictates the development then of uh, Jersey City as we go forward. Here's a kind of picture of Jersey City just industrializing a bit more. I'm getting very late, but we're just about done. Um, and it's a zoomed in version. You still see that, the, that there's still farms in Bergen even at 1865. And, uh, and here are the various townships that, in 1868, um, are about to be merged into what we call Jersey City. And then the proposal to consolidate Jersey City, Hoboken, Hudson County, and Bergen into one city. The fine print, actually, this is for a bit later, but there's, Har you guys all know Harsimus Cove. Mm -hmm. So Harsimus Cove was still a cove. It was like a, just a mud flat at the time and they, the railroads wanted to make sure it wasn't developed on, so they included that in the proposal to merge the cities. And then here's the actual vote. So you can see how few voters there are, even though the populations were as big as they were. Um, Jersey City voted basically two to one, four, and, uh, and the rule was that the, that the towns had to be contiguous in order for them to merge. So Union at the time, even though they voted to merge with Jersey City, did not merge because I think it was West Hoboken that was in between. Um, anyway, that's just a little bit. It's also very interesting to me that so few people kind of dictated the very shape of the politics that now hundreds of thousands of people um, deal with. So here's a kind of merged Jersey City. This is 1880s, and you still see this is a health and sanitary or sanitary and topological map. All of this little greenish area is still just putrid swamp. Oh, I know, it, it was, that's why the downtown had such a bad reputation for so long. Yeah, um, now where was, physically, where was Colgate? Because I know they, they had their cornerstone, Colgate was 1806, so where is Colgate in terms of downtown? Because it's really Paula's Hook area. Yeah, so here's, here's the beginning, this is the yeah. beginning of the land of, uh, of the land that yeah. is so Liberty Roman State Park. The edge. So they would be right, right around here. Oh. Um, and this is this amazing map from the library, um, which it actually kind of shows the buildings that were here. And you see these spaces that aren't filled in. Again, that's just because they're swamps. Um, and here's a little picture. We are in the very upper left corner, and you can kind of see that the embankment structures are starting. There's a tunnel. There's actually a road that no longer goes there. Um, right there, that was taken over by a streetcar and then forgotten to time. Um, and that, uh, that, at a solid hour, could be the end of our presentation, but I did promise you when the fill happened, so I'll just go a little longer. This is when the fill happens. By 1899, all these black lines are railroads, and all of this, all this kind of shaded area is newly filled land. Here's, uh, here's the original Van Voorst homestead, which at the time still had a building on it. This is the Harsimus Bay shoreline, and by then it's filled in by railroads. And those railroads, once they started, they just, they needed so much volume that they just kind of continued to fill in. So basically everywhere downtown, almost everywhere downtown that has skyscrapers was former, former fill from railroads. So if you want, if you want to know where like 
the island was, just walk around the townhouses and you were basically in the island. And then if you want to know where the water was, find a skyscraper and go walk next to it. But that's why then the water table really stinks and downtown floods so bad because it really is below. Yeah, yeah, there's a bit of a hill in the downtown. Um, but on the back side, that was a tidal flat. So it was a true island. And we, we didn't do quite as badly as Hoboken. But, um, but we filled that in. And this is kind of just showing you the extent. Yeah. I mean, you can see the scale here. Like, just look at Manhattan across yeah. the way. Um, but there's a great picture regarding those swamps. Um, marshes is a nicer name for it, but they weren't marshes. <laughs> this is 1891. And you can see Liberty State Park starting to be built out. That was all built, if, you, if anyone's not aware, that was all railroad. And this is where Jones Park is. And, uh, and these, these little bits are actually just exposed water. And so that's kind of the nature. If you see these houses, which still exist, this is, this is the back of, these, these back onto Jones Park. But if you see, they're reflected in, a, in just standing water. Um, and that's, that's kind of the nature of the entire so place. I was told that the Ramapo Fault is kind of ripe for an earthquake. What would happen to downtown? Well, uh, I mean, if you saw, and I think that I, I think I'll just take, start open to question and answers for now. Um, but if you saw the slide I had, the the largest earthquake we've ever had is a five on the record. Um, Wasn't there one? Because I experienced it about ten years ago. Yes. But it was, I think, it was yeah, more Virginia. But we, it was. We just, and I was on the third floor of the main library, and I saw the whole building go like this three times. Well, so if you remember, um, it, if you remember, I called these crystalline rocks. Right. So a good analogy is that when you hit, like when you, when you have an earthquake out west, those rocks are all loose and jumbled because that's an active tectonic zone. So it's like hitting a pile of gravel. When you have an earthquake in the east coast, it's like hitting a bell. So it resonates. Like you can have a small earthquake in Virginia and you'll feel it in Chicago. Okay. Um, but the Ramapo is a big fault line and theoretically if it if it went it could it, it, it because of its size could be larger but there's just no data to know yeah. um, often and of these are billion year old and, rocks and downtown because they're landfill yeah what would happen? you know they're all built up now but. you're completely right it, it, but it wouldn't just be them I mean, like if if the Ramapo went and it actually generated like something like a six, like split in no, nothing. I wasn't no. sure how deep it went. But is that when yeah. you were saying the development of the mountains? Is that where, where the Kittitutty Mountains had come from during all that time period? Yeah, the the um, every so the there were two mountain building events on the east coast the, that we know about at least. There was the one from 1.5 billion years ago that was the beginning of the supercontinent Rodinia. And then there was the Appalachians when Africa collided with North America. And so the Appalachians, the rock that's from that is like Pennsylvania, North Carolina, um, parts of New York. But, but up north, um, you have kind of, there's been more erosion and other collisions that you have the, the remnants of this older mountain building. And then if you go into New England, those are actually other island chains that kind of collided onto North America. Uh, any other questions? Uh, that's from that. That was the name that uh, Michael Poe uh, gave to the place. So he, I guess, I don't know. Was the, I don't know how he went from P A U W to Pavonia. Yeah. Yeah. Pavonia is Latin for peacock. Oh, okay. So there you go. Pavonia is Latin for peacock. That's why there's a comment in this area. Interesting. Um, yes? Please. Uh, how many slaves were in Jersey City before manumission? Uh, well, I, uh, I, I don't have those numbers. Um, Jersey City did have slaves. I did look this up at one point. Um, but, and it, there weren't very many, but the Dutch, like, the Dutch here were farmers, so they were more about, they were more like colonialists, like in the kind of, I'm gonna move my family here. And that's how the style of settlement 
was introduced by the Dutch here. So they weren't necessarily rich enough to own many slaves. But, um, but especially in the, there's a lot of stories about the Revolutionary War times. And, um, and, uh, like, and there were definitely many families that had slaves here. Um, and the Underground Railroad did actually come through here, um, through the Morris Canal. But, uh, but I don't know numbers. You mentioned the embankment. When was that built? Uh, the, there's two embankments. And for shame, I don't remember when the actual structure of the embankment was built. The, there was a first, there was, was, was the there were three stages. Well, so the first stage, they just built railroad on ground. So the railroads, the trains would come in and block every single street downtown. <coughs> and you couldn't do anything until they moved. And they would sometimes not move. So that's kind of, I think, why like different neighborhoods downtown identify like differently because there were these barriers. But then they put a trestle like made out of wood uh, so that you could, the streets were functional. And then ultimately they wanted to bring, um, because they had, they had six lines, six railroad tracks on top of the embankment. So when they built it, they built it so that they could have that much volume going from the Palisades. Plus the Palisades, um, they were at a higher elevation and trains need to kind of gradually go down. So they kind of gradually came down at that level. Thank you. I think it was like 19, 10 ish, I want to say. Was it? Could be a little off. Please. Do you know where the mill was actually located on Mill Creek? You bet. <laughs> um, well, we have a map of exactly where it was. And then, of course, since it's like my favorite exercise ever, I dug in to find out where that is currently. And basically it's underneath the uh, existing path roundhouse. Or, well, the roundhouse no longer exists, but let me, let me just find a picture for you first before I start chatting. Uh, okay, so here, oh. That's not even visible. Um, so this is from 1780s, and Pryor's Mill is right here. Um, if you look close, if you could see closely, there's two small structures, and so there was a small ford, I guess, across the, the creek right there. And so, um, and so this is that Mill Road part, and and so here's Mill Road. It goes onto the path train territory. And so it kind of comes down, and then just off of the picture, unfortunately, is where the old mill would have been. And it's completely just buried by, by the topography that the path, by the that the railroads introduced into that area. Um, when they did do that, when they brought the, because this is where this is where the railroads go now. The first railroad course actually went around this way because this was a stream bed. And so they had been digging through the Palisades rock, that magma is like very hard. And this was before even motorized vehicles. So they were just using donkeys and dynamite. And, uh, and so they gave up trying to blast through the, that point of rocks. So they went down the stream bed and around. And then when they got to Mill Creek, it actually caused huge delays because they just kept taking rocks and throwing it into Mill Creek. But the bedrock, it, it's just, it was just muck, right? And the bedrock is 150 feet down. So every day they would throw dirt, or, or trap rock, they called it, into the creek, and it would be like level, and then they'd come back and it'd be gone. <laughs> and and I, I don't know how long they did that, because the source I had didn't say, but they said it caused major delays to the construction of the process. Almost equivalent, they implied, to the blasting through the bedrock itself, which just blew my mind. But, but around the 1700, that's even when the whole thing with thinking you could tame Mother Nature, and that's why you have either New Orleans or the Netherlands yeah. below sea level, because they kept saying, we could, we could do this. Yeah, and no, of course, we, we were settled by the Dutch. <laughs> oh, speaking, yeah. by the way, speaking back to your point, there, are, there is a prior road in Jersey City, and it's, again, just off of this map. But you know where the elevated train line kind of comes out from that? There's a, there's a defunct road under it, just here, right off of this map, and it's called Prior Road. There's also a, de, right. a kind of patch piece that still you can drive on, but, but Prior Road is presumably named because people remembered it went to Prior's Mill. Mm -hmm. 
and it's exactly in the right spot. So I would find Pryor's Mitt Road, and then you'd know where you are. Yeah. Uh, when was the Morris Canal built again? Uh, it's like 1830s. So it precedes the railroads. As well. Yeah, so yeah, it does. And the track of the Morris Canal, um, actually, which I have, don't look too closely. I'm going to zoom through. Um, well, here, here's the old course of the Morris Canal. And they were actually, this was a topography-based coursing. So, so they were, there's just a big hill here. And they went around and then followed the coastline. So this is actually, this is all at sea level, um, wherever they go straight. Yeah? It's kind of morbid, but what's, where's the site of the uh, massacre now? Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's right, like, so it's on the, the, this is the Liberty Science Center right here. And um, there was a, there's like a hill that used to be kind of right around here. And so basically it's just this in general area because presumably they were, they were an informal group that was retreating. So they were just camped out in an open field. Um, and none of this land was here. But, um, and if so you- So just near the light rail stop outside the yeah, park. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And actually the, the coastline, so Communipaw Ave, which you can't quite see on this, but it kind of cuts down here. Commuter Paul Ave is one of those old roads that's been used forever. And it came right to where the, right to where the Liberty Science Center was, and that is where Commuter Paul was. <coughs> so where they're building, where they built the old one and the new one, that's on top of the original settlement of Jersey City, which is like 1630s. And that's also where the coastline was. And then this was a giant, humongous oyster field. Wow. Very shallow, like you could walk out onto it. Uh, I believe it's true that some of the uh, landfill that you know, occurred in the present day downtown, uh, in addition to it caused, being caused by local industrialization and the railroads, was also caused by sediment flowing down from industrialization farther north along the uh, Hudson River. Oh, uh, interesting. Yeah. yeah, I don't know about the, I'm, I'm just not familiar with the um, the sediment being caused by industry, but certainly um, sedimentation happened. Well, I think it was enhanced by. Uh, yeah, yeah, and they there was some there, there's some records when you look at them and they talk about, the, especially here. This is o oyster um, oyster reef, I think they called it, but this is all called Oyster Bay, and it's so shallow that people would notice the difference in the sea level, um, and this. Um, the Hudson River kind of comes and then cuts to the right originally and so that that makes this the inside corner and on the inside corner of any river you have deposition so yeah that would make perfect sense um, uh, that's just a little plug for the embankment speaking of plugs by the way on the um, on the on the reception table I have some brochures for a fundraiser that the reservoir is happening uh, having uh, just in two weeks time so if anyone is interested in preservation and you want to give, have a nice dinner, it's um, over on New York Avenue that we'll be having a little dinner and get together. Yeah, please. So uh, why did Manhattan and New York develop so much more and so much faster than Jersey City? Uh, I think it comes down to the fact that when the Duke of York was given, um, when he was given the New, ne New Netherlands, he owed Carteret a lot of money. And so he gave Jersey to Carteret and then claimed the entire river for himself. So when the, when the Dutch first got here, they were choosing their settlement between Governor's Island, Manhattan, and Communipaw, which would be like right there. And they decided that Manhattan was kind of the most, had the most defen defensive options along with, because uh, it had some rich farms itself and that this would, that Community Paul would be hard to defend. But there's no, between these two places, there's no real like reason why one or, or the other would be favored, um, except that politically, New York became the home of, of the entire state. And politically, Jersey was divided in two at first between two different owners, and they were mismanaged forever. And J New Jersey actually doesn't really have as many resources. So the state itself was poorer. 
like New York has much more um, resources available to it, much more farmland available to it. So it just built over time. But I think if if Jersey City had always been part of New York, you'd see a much different place. Yeah, <coughs> so the, the proprietary period of New Jersey under um, Carter and Berkeley didn't last that long. Uh, yeah. Because. Oh, I'm not saying that the right. governance at that time caused it. I'm saying just the border right. being located on the water's edge. Because the Duke of York then becomes James II, uh, ultimately is replaced by the quote unquote glorious revolution by William and Mary from the Netherlands. <laughs> so that, that helped, I think, to, uh, in some ways, preserve the Dutch character. Uh, yeah. And, and, and shortly thereafter, New Jersey became a royal colony and unified. Uh, so within the span of 30 years. Yeah, I, I just think that, that, that the fact that they couldn't build a water-based uh, water based industry in Jersey City stifled its growth, yeah, sure. which may have been for the best. Yeah, I guess one more. It looks, yeah. I think. What year did you say uh, Harsimus Cove was built in? Uh, I don't know that by heart, but maybe I can find it for you. Hmm. Well, this is 1899, and it's already being filled in. I unfortunately, don't say I don't seem to have a note on exactly when it was filled. But this map, which sorry, in this map it is already filled in, and that's 1883. So that's as good as I could do for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, please. Um, so that's a lot of uh, landfill. Um, did it all come from locally, like from the Palisades and the cuts and stuff like that? Or was anything brought in from farther afield? Uh, so a lot of it came from the Palisades, like trap rock when they mined, because the Bergen, the Bergen cut was huge amounts of rock. The Erie Tunnel, um, the other cut um, that the path train follows. But if um, like there's there's a famous lawsuit of the residents of Greenville against New York City and the Lehigh Valley Railroad because much of um, much of Liberty State Park was just filled in with trash from the city of New York. Um, then similarly on the backside where we have all the parking or the car sales, those used to be actual just landfills. Um, so a lot of it's just detritus. Ash was a huge one because people burned so much and they needed to put all that ash. So a lot of the a lot of this land ends up being filled with just ash deposits. Yeah. Um, Wasn't it ballast from ships also? Uh, I, I presume that, yeah. yeah. I, I, they, they had to unload the ballast and put, so yeah. That, that would make a lot of sense. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think they just took whatever trash they could find. Uh, yeah, sure. Sorry. I told you. Why do you think it's both part of the, uh, the wall in the, in the older part of the house? Could you identify what's going on? You know, I did look at it and I tried to see, peek. It looks like a sandstone. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's all as good as I could do. They painted yeah, most of it, so. It is sandstone, but it, it's also the same sandstone that the uh, Bergen Church is made out of. It's from the same quarry, same time period, too. So the oldest stone in the house on that corner with the exposed wall. That's, where, do you know where the quarry is? I, ha I'll, I have a location I can get it to. Oh, that's yeah, fascinating. It's nearby. It's not too far. Yeah. Because there is some, yeah, there, yeah. There's, some, there's some sandstone outcrops on the, on the backside. Of of the like hill, so um, facing facing the Hackensack. So presumably it's one of those. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're yeah. We're up. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Luke. This yeah. Was so